Okay, great. Buenos dias. <laughs> well, thank you, Florian, and uh, it is great to be here with you to share some of the lessons from New York City and some of the lessons from uh, around the world. Uh, so before we get started, how many of you have been to New York City? Excellent. And how many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? Excellent. Okay. How many of you have been to New York City in the last two years? Oh my God, you're practically New Yorkers. <laughs> well, if you've been to New York City in the last few years, you know there have been huge changes on New York City streets. And I'm also here to invite you to New York City if you haven't been there yet. We have a new city with new bike lanes, new bus lanes, some of which you'll just have to imagine. There we go. Plazas. We took a page from Bogota and set up a ciclovia uh, called Summer Streets. And seven years ago, there wasn't even a public vocabulary for all these kinds of new designs. And yet today, they're seen as just business as usual for New Yorkers. They've become fluent in this new language. But we all know that changing the status quo is never easy. But it is mission critical for our cities. This is the scene in too many places around the world today with streets that are designed to move cars and everybody else is left stranded at the side of the road. And this has deadly results. We have 141 people that die on our roads every hour. That is one person every 30 seconds. By the time I finish talking with you, 45 people will have been killed on streets. And it's become a public health crisis. But somehow, people just sort of shrug their shoulders about it. It's just sort of seen as something that's part of life in the big city. And this crisis is going to get worse. Over half the world lives in cities today and by 2050, 70% of the world is going to live in cities. Right now, traffic fatalities are the ninth leading cause of death around the world, and they're climbing that list fast. So the choices that we make today about how we lay out our streets, how we prioritize our streets, has implications for people in cities today but also for generations to come. It's sometimes hard to remember that our streets didn't always used to be this way. This is actually Lower Manhattan in the year 1900. And you can see there were shared spaces, there were sidewalks, you know, the extensions of storefronts, uh, they were basically our living rooms. And in just a few decades, we went from that to this. You know, this, this so-called love affair with the car really is not a love affair. It's a sort of 20th century invention. And in fact, it's more like an arranged marriage. Uh, and I would have to say that the thrill is gone. And today there is a new type of love affair going on in cities like Medellin. Cities that challenge the idea that streets are only for cars. You might see, say that we're seeing other modes these days. And we're making new friends along the way.
This is a picture making new friends along the way. <laughs> friends in Medellin, so I don't know what that says. So in New York, we started down this same path in 2007 when Mayor Bloomberg launched his Plan YC initiative. It was a long range plan that recognized that the design of our cities is key to the future of the planet and that we needed to make course corrections today if we wanted to live in a city with a million more people in 2030 and have it be greater and greener than it is with the 8.4 million New Yorkers that live there today. It was a great goal, but what does that mean for our streets? It means prioritizing pedestrians, bikes, and buses, it means making more room to enjoy the city. It means making our streets safer for everyone. But when you do these things, something magical happens along the way. It doesn't just change a street. It reconnects a city and unlocks its potential. Transforming a place from where people want to park to where people want to be, a change that we made over a weekend. Following the footsteps of people, like here in Union Square, the desire lines, where they wanted to walk, and we created a new front yard for New Yorkers in Union Square, made it much easier to shop, much easier to enjoy the markets. We turned a sea of traffic lanes in Times Square into a hectare of new public space at the crossroads of the world, building a new living room for the 500,000 people that walk through that part of New York every day. And this magic is not limited to New York. We are seeing these designs spread all over the world here in downtown Mexico City, here in Buenos Aires, here in London where they're changing the geometry of their streets. Even, it even works in the southern hemisphere. This is here in Auckland. Closer to home, a big focus of our work was on bikes. And we took streets like these that said basically to cyclists, just bike at your own risk. Bike if you dare, because we're not going to take care of you. And we woke them up from their car-centric stupor. And these changes had dramatic impacts beyond even the bike lanes. They dramatically reduced injuries, and they dramatically increased retail sales. And we saw similar results on streets like First Avenue with our protected bike lanes. But these changes are not just about giving people a place to bike. They're part of an economic development strategy. When you think about it, people and companies can move anywhere. So designing world-class streets that encourage people to live, to work, and play, to really enjoy the city in new ways, that is an important economic development strategy for your city. You will attract and retain the people that you want to have. And these roads that you see here, like roads in Medellin, come in all shapes and sizes. And so we created an extensive menu of different designs for different streets. When we didn't have room for a buffer, we painted high visibility green bike lanes. And when we did have the room, we would put in two-way lanes with protected barriers. And we also painted bike boxes all over the city. Wow, this is really a wild little experience here. Um, just giving you a preview of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so in six years, we put down 643 kilometers of on-street bike lanes. 643 kilometers. So we went from this to this. And I love showing this because it looks so easy. You just click it and all the lines are there 
and voila, you know, new bike lane. Um, I wish it was that easy, but we created a new backbone, a new biking backbone that took cyclists where they needed to go and where they wanted to go, connecting to key bridges, and it was extraordinary. And it didn't cost a lot of money. For all of the work that we did, all of those kilometers, everything that we did to build the bike lanes, everything that we did to build the plazas was less than 1% of our capital program. I think bike lanes are one of the most cost-effective, one of the best investments that a city can make in its present and for its future. So not surprisingly, you're seeing this happen all over the United States. Oh, come on. Maybe somebody can help. Where should I point this? Where? Point it there? I'm going to keep pointing it right there. I'm just going to hold it like this. Okay. So. Places like Austin, Texas. Texas. Texas putting bike lanes in. Places like Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is like the congestion capital of the United States. Seattle, Washington. If you've been to Seattle, you'll know it's very damp there. I think they actually paint their bike lanes in moss. And Indianapolis. This is a city that's known for the Indy 500, a speedway, not exactly known for bikes. Chicago where I let you know that today the temperature in Chicago is minus zero degrees. And Los Angeles, when you know that the car capital of the United States, Los Angeles, is painting bike lanes like this, putting in infrastructure like this, you know that there's a seismic shift that's underway. You kind of expect it in San Francisco, but in one of the nation's premier roadways, Pennsylvania Avenue, when we put a bike lane there, it's extraordinary. And I think given the political gridlock in Washington, D.C., it's probably the only way uh, to get around. This is a global movement from London to Vancouver to Kyoto, Japan, Turkey, Tel Aviv to Toronto. It's extraordinarily exciting to see the change on the ground on the biking front. And there's probably no better way to build on this biking infrastructure than with bike share, to unlock the power and the potential of your streets. It's really become an essential form of transportation in many cities, really being the first mile and last mile uh, connections to transit. So in New York, we leveraged this investment and launched City Bike. How many of you have taken City Bike? Great. Well, you probably used one of the 6,000 bikes and took them to one of the 330 stations. It is the first new transportation system in New York City in 60 years. Now, you have new cable cars and you have new escalators and you have new metro. We really didn't have anything new. So this was really the first thing that we had. And it didn't cost anything to taxpayers. It was all privately supported. It was also publicly sourced. 65,000 New Yorkers weighed in on where they wanted these stations to be, very close together, right next to transit stops. So with all of these changes, we saw a quadrupling of people who biked. We saw the safest streets in New York City history, thanks to all of the cyclists that were out on our streets now. So you would think this would be great news, right? Not exactly. This bike-friendly change really threatened the status quo. And when you push the status quo, the status quo pushes back hard. 
And these bikes became very hotly contested. And they kept being talked about in terms of the conflict that they created for just a few people, but not the benefits that they delivered for everyone. And there were dire predictions that there was going to be blood on the streets and mayhem. And the newspapers raised all sorts of concerns. They said the bikes were too blue, they were too heavy, that homeless people would use them for pickup spin classes. I mean, crazy stuff. Even my favorite journalist, John Stewart, got in to the mix. Uh, he weighed in after a Wall Street Journal editorial board members started talking about how the city of New York was taken over by the all-powerful bike lobby. So, while newsrooms were having a field day with these headlines, New Yorkers were having their own experience. They were city biking to work. They were city biking to weddings. They were city biking to the prom. And even some celebrities got into the action. And importantly, the results of the program speak for themselves. People have taken 16 million trips. They have ridden some 25 million miles. They've ridden a thousand times around the earth. And it's not just in New York. Some 36 cities in the United States have some form of bike share, and they have taken 23 million trips with not a single, no fatality whatsoever. So much for the blood on the streets concern. And around the globe, you're, you're seeing even larger bike share systems that are uh, an update a new kind of status quo. There are over 700,000 bikes in 700 cities. And these new systems are coming online almost daily. And they're merging with new technology to provide additional mobility with car sharing services like Uber and Lyft and Car2Go. The future of transportation isn't about building more roads and building more cars. It is about using what we have more effectively and more efficiently with technology. You know, but technology is actually the easy part. Changing culture is the hard part. No matter where you are in the world, bike lanes are one of the most controversial programs that a city can undertake. And people blame them for traffic jams, they blame them because they're dangerous, they're confusing, but what we found in New York was that people are ahead of the press and people are ahead of the politicians. This was the last opinion poll that was taken uh, at the end of the Bloomberg administration. And if bike lanes, if bike share, if uh, plazas were running for office, they would win in a landslide. As you can see, yes, good. They're much more attractive than some of the politicians that we see uh, these days. And a key part of uh, any strategy, and I think it's important for everybody in this room, is support of the advocacy community. We would not have made the changes that we made on the ground without the support of leaders in the community, people like you that are here today. It made all the difference. When people came out and opposed these changes, we had rooms and rooms and rooms filled, streets filled with people that wanted, demanded these new changes. And organizations like Transportation Alternatives were key allies in making the case for these kinds of changes. Groups like Families for, for Safe Streets who are demanding an end to the traffic violence that we see on our streets these days. But it's not just about changing the street. It is about changing people's hearts and minds. Safety campaigns like this one, like Vision Zero, and campaigns all over the world like it, are changing our expectations for our streets. And the next natural step is changing the design standards for our streets that are really 50 years old. 
and they've basically been designed for highways and not for cities. We're now documenting best practices like the work that we're seeing here in Medellin and providing a menu of new options, new designs uh, that give people a permission slip to innovate on their streets. And these new designs prioritize people on two feet and on two wheels. And after a century of car domination, we are seeing a global demand for infrastructure, bike infrastructure, and not just from the usual suspects that you would see in Copenhagen or in Amsterdam, but in places like New York and other cities around the world. And you know, when a movement shows up in Lego, you know we are starting to win the culture war. <laughs> so these changes can be difficult, they can be controversial, but we've seen if the ideas are worthwhile, if they're well executed, the good outcomes will outweigh the bad headlines. And it doesn't take millions to do, and it doesn't take decades to do. It takes vision, it takes political leadership, it takes the energy and passion of everyone in this room. We can change our streets, we can change our cities, we can and we must. Thank you.